What's up guys? We're gonna do another shop talk episode here. It's been a little while since I've done one and there's a couple of subjects that's been brought up here recently in discussion. So I thought I would go over them and answer some more questions. And we might grab the handheld and do a little walk around. I got a couple other things that I can show you too. So there might be a little bit of editing in this one, but uh, we'll keep it to a minimum. But if before I was kind of giving you a highlight of some things that I've, that's going on in the shop. So that's what I'm doing here. I, I mentioned in s, &S we got these pistons right here to work on. So I've been making a fixture to be able to hold those pistons. And that's a project video that's coming up and I'll most likely show the first part of that this coming weekend after s, &S. So we got to put that film together. And then this is the part from Doug Hanchard up in Canada that had, he had sent this to me and asked me if I could help him build a couple of these. It's a it's an adjuster for it's for toe adjustment on a race car and it's 5 8 18 thread. You got a right hand and a left hand on here. So I was lucky and found my bag of left hand nuts here this evening I had I had put together a bag of a bunch of left handed nuts a long time ago I went to the hardware store and bought a bunch of them and labeled them labeled them in little bags because uh, oftentimes I would get a little job like this in the shop and people would need something threaded or there would be a job that just had some left hand threads I really didn't have a good way to gauge it other than to uh, measure you know your thread pitch so I liked having nuts around that I could use as a gauge also. So that's what I did was uh, gather up some sets of nuts. So I, I found that old bag and uh, yeah, it's sitting down there. I should have brought it down here to show you, but it's got a bunch of different left hand nuts in it and very useful to have. I've also got a plastic case down there buried under that shelf that has got a full set of regular hex nuts uh, ranging from screw size all the way up to inch and a quarter I believe and fine and fine thread and coarse thread and I did that also so that when I was threading something I have a nut there to um, check it oftentimes in a in a job shop when you're just doing quick jobs repair jobs you're just doing something for somebody you're you're not necessarily needing to be uh, very precise about the pitch diameter that kind of stuff when you're threading you know, a lot of times when you thread something, you just need an everyday nut that you can get at a hardware store or whatever to screw on there, and that's and that'll suffice many times. So I'm not saying this for every job, but for a lot of jobs around the shop, a regular hex nut is fine. So I like to keep those sets around to use. So anyway, we're going to make a couple of these in aluminum. I've got some aluminum stock here, and then also he wants one in steel. So. I found this piece of 4130 that a viewer had given me, and we may use this. I'm not sure yet. I've got some 4140 also that we may uh, we may use. I'm kind of waiting to hear back from Doug to ask him what his preference is on that. So we got that coming up. We got the piston job coming up, and I want to talk about some end mills right here. And I had somebody ask me about uh, center cutting end mills, so I'm going to grab the camera and we're going to get a. I'm going to give you a little closer look at these so we can talk about that. And then one other question I had was somebody had asked me how I mount my indicators on these Nogas. So as far as a regular dial indicator, this is how I mount them. And we talked about this very early on in the channel. It's a very easy modification, very simple. You just need to take any, you can use a rod, you can take a piece of material, and drill and tap it and use a bolt but you can turn and thread it if you want to get fancy and just put a nut on there but you just need a 3 8 shank and then this will be this a quarter inch hole in the, lug in, in the lug back of the indicator so you mount it so that the indicator is in line with the indicator holder and I have always found that that is much easier to use when you want to get this adjusted up to your part, you know, and make it perpendicular to your workpiece whenever you're indicating. So the way that these are made traditionally to hold your indicator is 
this part of your indicator right here is also 3 8 and you can stick it in there like that and snug that up. It's also got a dovetail up here so you can mount your um, test indicators, that kind of stuff. But this right here, when you're trying to get up there and indicate your shaft, see this is a little bit harder to get lined up. I mean you can still do it that way and a lot of people do and that's fine, but I just don't like it like that. Now there is times when this is useful. Uh, sometimes whenever I'm tramming in the vise from a horizontal boring mill, it works out better for me to set the indicator up like that because I stick this over there on the spindle and I mount my indicator like that and I run that spindle back and forth across the vise jaws. So that's, that's a, an occasion when I do mount it like this. So if you haven't already done this mod, it's very simple. Just make something like that any way that you want with a nut, a bolt, whatever. I mean, you can, that's just a fun little shop project. This one right here was made for me by a viewer named David Kirtley. And there's another piece that went on the other side here that was kind of stylish. And it, his idea was that it was a handle that you can use to move this around. But I, I found that I didn't like using that. So I just used that part of the uh, part that David had made. The stem, I think that's what we call it, is a 3 8 stem for your lug back. All right, so there's that. So I want to grab the handheld and uh, come in here and let's talk about these end mills real quick. All right, so this one is for our friend Chuck Bomarito, outside screwball. He left a comment not long ago and asked if I could explain the differences between a center cutting and non-center cutting end mill. All right, uh, it's another one of those things that I don't I don't really think about much. It's just something in my mind and and. Uh, you know, he asked us, like, that's a good topic we can talk about. So I've got a couple end mills here. So these three here are center cutting. And these over here are non-center cutting. Some are very easy to see that they're non-center cutting. So if you look at any end mill, if it's relieved in the center, it's not center cutting. Okay? All of these, that's a center. There's a center there. This little 3 8 end mill has a center in it. All right, so on. Now this roughing end mill right here is actually ground and it's a little deceiving. That looks like it's center cutting, but it's not. There's a, there's a little center section right in the middle that's not even ground, that's just flat. And if you look, none of the flutes are ground all the way across to the center. So a center cutting, you're gonna have both of your flutes that's ground to the center, just like a, a drill bit. And it's typically you're going to find that two of them, 180 out, are ground to the center. But I do have some, some roughing end mills at work that are uh, center cutting, but only one of the flutes are ground all the way to the center. And then you, and it's, it's a funky grind, and it's kind of hard to explain, but it works really well. All right, this one here, this one is also center, center cutting here. These two flutes right here will cut to the center they're ground so that they will center cut. If you try to use an end mill that's not center cutting, you'll know, you'll be able to plunge whatever depth, say like this one right here, it'll, it'll stop because you'll start rubbing that surface right there. Same way with these, you'll, you'll, you can plunge with these a little bit and then it'll stop and you'll see you've got like a little pyramid there that it's not cutting. This is a typical, this is a 3 8 just a two flute end mill and same way, that is center cutting. So you can use center cutting to plunge. Non-center cutting, you cannot plunge. So if you ever need to take one and you need to go down, like if you're drilling a hole, you need a center cutting end mill. One other thing to uh, point out with center cutting end mills, and I don't know if this applies to every mill, um, the roughing end mills I know, I believe are, are straight. But if you look across the flutes there, that's not completely flat. They're relieved a little bit in the center. Okay? So when you come down with these end mills and touch, you're going to see a, it's going to start scribing an outside circle. And as you go a little deeper, it'll, it'll finally cut the full radius there. And they do that to relieve the, the flute whenever you're cutting like a slot or a keyway, stuff like that. So, 
All right, that's a little crash course on center cutting versus non-center cutting end mills. I oftentimes get a lot of people that comment on uh, the, the cleanliness of my shop, which I really appreciate. I do try to keep a clean shop and keep it organized, but the floors are oftentimes, I need to get them swept up and clean. So right now the floors are dirty. I haven't swept in a while. I have problems with this concrete. It wants to make up a lot of dust whenever I sweep. So I try to not to sweep very much. And when I do, I use sweeping compound uh, floor sweep and it helps keep the dust down. So you can see, I really need to get in here and clean. I've got some dirty floors, but I try to keep the machines halfway decent. So that's just a little closer look because you can't always see my floors in the videos. But I do try, I try to keep them clean the best I can. I did a little sweeping back here. So this is something else that has uh, come up here recently. At work, we bought some new anti-fatigue floor mats and they're really awesome. I've got them around all the machines now and I like them so much that I'm, that I'm gonna buy them for myself for this shop. These are some really old kitchen floor mats that I got at Sam's Club years and years ago and that's the only two I got left and they're just, they're just wore out. So I bought one that should be coming sometime this week and I'm gonna put it right here. We'll start right here and once I get that one, uh, probably next month I'm going to buy another one and it'll go right in here in front of the, the Victor lathe. And I'd like to get another one to replace this in front of the mill. So we'll just see. They're not, they're not cheap. These are going to be some high quality floor mats, but I like them and, they, and I can already tell the difference. They're just, they're so much nicer to stand on. So I thought I'd talk about that. You know, that's just something that I'll probably be showing an S and S here pretty soon whenever I get it and uh, throw it down on the floor. But I just want to kind of comment on how dirty my floor is around here. <laughs> I need a little shop helper to help me sweep up. I did use this for the first time this week. That's the dual nozzle Noga Mini Cool that uh, Avi had given me from Noga. It works really well. So I did a little bit of slitting this week, which you'll see coming up in the project video. And that worked really good. You can take this, uh, damn that net, magnet strong. You can just position those where you want around your cutter, you know. I really like it. It, it worked out pretty good and it's going to be a nice feature on, on this mill right here. All right, so I think that's going to be it for this episode of Shop Talk. And as always, if you got any other questions or you got something that you would like for me to cover, please leave a comment and I take notes and I need to go back to the other old videos and take some more notes on other topics of uh, shop talk discussions you guys want me to go over and see what I've missed. So, all right, see you later.